singularity. That's my cue. Good afternoon, everyone. It is truly a pleasure and honor to be with you here today. I've come all the way from California and most recently from Africa. I was there just last week. Uh, we did a summit in South Africa. And I'm really delighted to be sharing with you my insights that I have on how exponential technology can help us solve the world's biggest challenges. As Patrick mentioned, I am the Vice President of Impact at Singularity University, which means I look at everything we do, from our curriculum to our, our programs, to our partnerships, to our community, of how to maximize positive impact in the world and solve the world's biggest challenges. And I'm going to talk with you today about how those world's biggest challenges can not only be solved, but they represent the biggest opportunities for you to get engaged. This is what we call the Global Grand Challenges at Singularity University. We have 12 of them. You might already be familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals from the United Nations. Our 12 Global Grand Challenges are perfectly complementary to the SDGs. In fact, you'll find some that are very similar. Um, and these are Global Grand Challenges that we feel are solvable. And in fact, I know you probably can't read the fine print here, but if you go on our website, you can see for every single one of these Global Grand Challenges, we've identified and we've outlined the end state goal that we feel is achievable in the next 20 to 30 years, meaning we can solve for energy, we can solve for food, we can solve for water, et cetera, et cetera. This is the mindset we have, and I'm going to share with you today some emerging technologies and some challenges. I came across this quote from someone that I respect tremendously, that some of you might know, uh, an American philosopher named Noam Chomsky. And I read this quote. It says, if you assume there is no hope, you guarantee that there will be no hope. If you assume that there is an instinct for freedom, that there is opportunity, that there are opportunities to change things, then there is a possibility you can contribute to making a better world. And I think Noam Chomsky meant that to be an inspiring quote. And yet, when I read it, I actually thought, I felt disturbed. Something about that quote bothered me. And I realized what bothered me is that hope is not good enough. We can't hope to solve our world's biggest challenges. There needs to be a rationale. There needs to be a mechanism by which we truly can solve them. Which takes us to this graph that Ray Kurzweil put, produced and was already um, uh, pr uh, uh, presented to you by Will Weissman. This is a logarithmic curve that shows the exponential trend of computing. And in fact, our, our last speaker, uh, talked about the exponential uh, trends in computing tremendously. Furthermore, our other co-founder, uh, Peter Diamandis, put together this framework, the six Ds, which explains that when technology gets digitized, things become dematerialized, demonetized, democratized, and we go through this stage of feeling initially that things are uh, growth is deceptive and then it becomes very disruptive. That Things that we, we feel are only Im imaginable in our minds become very possible. Another uh, author named Jeremy Rifkin wrote this book called The Zero Marginal Cost Society. And he shows the difference between the green line there, which is economic models based on scarcity, meaning the price of things go up, versus the red line, which is economic models based on abundance. What happens? What happens when energy becomes increasingly available and the price of it can, goes down approaching zero? What happens when food becomes abundant and the price of it becomes approaching zero? Water and all of our quote, scarce resources become increasingly more available and the price of it continues to pr proceed towards zero. That takes us into what is called a zero marginal cost society. And in fact, there's plenty of evidence for abundance. Peter Diamandis keeps a running tab of uh, statistics that show the progress that we've made as humanity over time. This is just one of them. Probably 
of all the statistics that matters the most in the world, this one of the children who die before the age of five is probably the most important and, 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 and close to our hearts as parents. This shows an increasing downward trend of which we have much to be proud of. Another thinker named Steven Pinker says that these are the most peaceful times in history. If you look back over the course of the last hundreds, thousands of years, there's never been a more peaceful time in history. So says Steven Pinker. And yet, we are living in an abundance paradox. At the very same time that we are achieving so much abundance and making great progress in solving our world's biggest challenges, it is clearly evident that we face tremendous challenges right here, right now. Earlier this year, the United Nations announced that currently the world is facing the largest humanitarian crisis since 1945. There are more refugees on our planet right now than there were at the end of World War II. Furthermore, a group called the Union of Concerned Scientists every year puts out what they call the Doomsday Clock. The Doomsday Clock, as it approaches midnight, we reach closer and closer to global doomsday, global catastrophe, from catastrophic events like nuclear war or catastrophic events like climate change or others. Right now, the clock is two and a half mid minutes to midnight. This is the closest they've put the clock ever since 1950. We're closer to a catacly cataclysmic event on our planet than we were at the height of the nuclear war at area in 1950s. And I have to say, with all due humility, the reason why they put it closer to, to midnight this year was because of the election of President Trump. So I want to go with you some of the global grand challenges that, are, that, that uh, I already presented and some of the emerging techno technological advances that are happening. We'll start with environment. We know climate change is a severe threat to our planet. It's a severe threat to all of our livelihoods. It's a slow onset crisis, meaning day in, day out, we barely feel the changes, and yet the evidence is clear. Whether it be sea level rise, atmospheric carbon dioxide, global temperatures, and Arctic sea ice minimum, the evidence is irrefutable that we are headed towards a cataclysmic event on our planet lest we change our ways. Fortunately, CEOs, leading CEOs of the world, are finally realizing that this is not a, an issue that they can ignore. PricewaterhouseCooper did a survey of global CEOs last year. Half of leading CEOs now recognize climate change as a threat to their own growth prospects. And in fact, ironically enough, I think you probably followed the news earlier this year when the Trump administration was talking about leaving the Paris Accord. Who were the leading corporations that were saying, no, no, stay in it, we need to deal with this? Exxon Mobil, a leading oil and gas company. So they get the message. CEOs realize that we can no longer ignore climate change. This is a book that was released just about two months ago. Um, by Paul Hawken and Associates, and it's a comprehensive list of existing solutions that we have to address climate change and to actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They call it drawdown. And in fact, none of the solutions they present in this book are technological solutions. They're ex solutions that exist today. And yet, technology is going to help us out of this. Not least of which is the incredibly uh, uh, downward exponential trend of photovoltaics and solar-powered energy. My colleague and friend Ramez Nam is going to talk with you in detail about exponential energy trends tomorrow. But this is a, a dramatic graph that shows how the price of photovoltaics continues to drop. And furthermore, there are new breakthroughs in material science that are happening. Just one is something called perovskite, a material which is not only more efficient than photovoltaics, but is transparent, meaning all of our skyscraper windows, our car windows, can be energy producers. And here is 
a fascinating illustration of how even the experts, and in fact, I'll say, especially the experts, do not appreciate exponential trends because exponential trends are not intuitive to us humans. We tend to think linearly, even though we know better. Every time the World Energy Outlook has made a prediction of, the, uh, of, of the sol solar energy capacity, they've predicted basically linear growth every single year. The black line is what happened. Every single year, you'd think they would get it right. After missing it like three years, you'd think they would sit down and say, hey, are we really getting our predictions anywhere close to reality? They're not. They're not because exponential trends are not intuitive to us. This is one of the prime outcomes that we hope that you'll get from this summit is to take on this exponential mindset and see what is possible and what is coming our way with the driver of exponential technology. Trees are a great way to deal with climate change. We need more trees. We shouldn't be cutting them down. Here's an example of, a te of technology which will help us plant billions of trees. This is a company called Biocarbon Engineering, which is affiliated with Singularity University. They've outfitted drones, and the drones have a, a uh, they're able to inject sea pods into the ground, and the drones are able to fly to remote places and inject, their hope, billions of trees every year. Water. We think of water as a scarce resource, and in fact it is. But the irony is, on our planet, we have the big blue dot is all water, the small little blue dot is fresh water, and in fact, we access less than 1% of all water on planet Earth. By far the majority of water on planet Earth is in our oceans. Fortunately, the energy required to desalinate water is following a downward exponential trend, and that's largely driven by material science and engineering membranes at the atomic level and molecular level. This is a material a breakthrough that happened earlier this year called graphene oxide, where the, the graphene is designed specifically just to let water molecules through water molecules through and everything else out with a very low friction and theref therefore low energy costs. And our water is not just in the oceans, our water is everywhere. We have water in this room right now, in our atmosphere. So another breakthrough that happened earlier, just about two months ago, actually four months ago, from MIT, was something called a metal organic framework, again designed at the atomic level. This is a material that specifically absorbs water, and it's highly absorbent of water from our atmosphere and nothing else. They can absorb water in areas with 20% humidity, meaning they can absorb water in deserts. Imagine, if you will, the, the breakthrough of this, where if your household didn't need water connected through pipes, but if you had a unit that just absorbed water from the atmosphere, Think about the disruption that would happen in our current water supplies and the access to water for billions of people on our planet who currently do not have good access to water. Food. Ironically, while 800 million people in the world are chronically food insecure, over 2 billion people in the world are obese or overweight. Both of these are problems. And ending hunger is doable. There's a group in Copenhagen called the Copenhagen Consensus, and they rank all of our global grand challenges according to which ones we should invest the money in because we have finite amounts of resources for the biggest return. And consistently, ending hunger is the second on the list. The first one on the list, by the way, is ending infectious diseases. And their analysis is based on existing technology, not future technology. But we know better. We know the future of the farm is going to be different. It's going to be highly efficient. They'll be using drone, they are, this is not future, this is now, quite frankly, using drones to survey agricultural fields and detect pests, using uh, agribots to do your harvesting, to big data to analyze your agricultural trends, 
cows that are texting each other and texting the farmer for when they're ill or for when they need to be milked, and smart tractors. And our food will not just come from the farm. Increasingly, it'll come from new form factors like vertical farms. Vertical farms are still coming of age. They're following, one of the key limiting factors of vertical farms is the LED uh, uh, lighting and energy. And yet, we're seeing yet again an exponential tr downward trend. In Shanghai, a whole new district is forming in Shanghai. You, you know the pace of development in China is incredible. It's awesome. They're building a whole district right in the middle of Shanghai, which will just be for vertical farms. 3D printing of food is just beginning. By the way, that's not a real hamburger, and that's not Patrick. <laughs> but this is where we're going. I'm not talking about 3D printing Patrick yet. But this is where we're going with food. So right now, you can get food um, uh, 3D printed with chocolates and things like that. In the future, increasingly, we'll be able to 3D print all kinds of foods. On your air airplane, you'll be getting 3D printed food. In your own home, you'll have 3D printers, which will be 3D printing food. And here's another one that, uh, that I find really fascinating. And that is, whenever you find a massive inefficiency in our world, that inefficiency will get resolved. Meat, and beef in particular, and I speak to you as a person who eats meat and beef, I know is massively inefficient. It does tremendous damage to our environment. If you compare beef as compared to other meat products, greenhouse gases, water, feed and grain, and land, it's far more damaging to our environment than any other meat products. So what's going to happen when billions and more people become, uh, not only are, come onto our planet, but also get, rise out of poverty, what do they want most when they rise out of poverty? Meat. Is our meat supply sustainable? It's not. It's not according to our environmental needs. So that's a system that is ripe for disruption. In vitro meat is something which is just beginning now. This is taking the live tissues of a cow and growing it in a petri dish, in a laboratory, in a sterile environment, without killing the animal, and doing that in a way which uses just a fraction of the land, a fraction of the water, a fraction of the energy. So I'll ask you a question now. I'd like you to think about this. If, let's say hypothetically, in the next 10 years, you go to the supermarket and you see an in vitro meat product that didn't kill an animal, has minimal environmental damage, is nutritious, and in fact, you could get different types of nutritional quality meat products, and is less expensive then the other product, the other product killed an animal, was environmentally damaging and more expensive. Which of those two products would you buy? Could you raise your hand if you would buy product, the first product, the in vitro meat? Raise your hand if you would buy the regular uh, meat. All right, I, I'm not seeing anyone in the back rows raise their hands. Let's do that one more time. <laughs> one more time. Okay, this is a hypothetical. In the next 10 years, you'll go to the supermarket. Product A will be an in vitro meat product. It didn't kill an animal, didn't have environmental damage, and is less expensive. Product B killed an animal, had environmental damage, and costs more. Raise your hand if you would buy product A. Okay. Raise your hand if you would buy product B. Uh-huh, interesting. Okay, so more of, you, more, of you, more of you actually would buy product A. So you're already thinking exponentially. I think this is a fascinating example because exponential technology will change our culture. It changes our cultural relationship with things. And in fact, we had a, uh, I'm not even sure if he's in the room right now, we, we had a Japanese participant in our Global Solutions program this last summer um, named Yuki Hanu, and he's already taking this one step further. His vision is to actually every home to be able to produce in vitro meat in the house, not even go to the supermarket. 
He's already thinking beyond the laboratory, and he wants you to be able to make in in vitro meat in your own home. But in vitro meat isn't the only solution. This is other, these are other products which use plant-based proteins to make uh, meat substitutes. And there's also a whole new field called cellular agriculture, whereby foodstuffs are being made from the molecular level on up. This is a product which is already available from Clara Foods, which is egg whites without any eggs involved, without any chickens involved. Just laboratory-created egg whites. Learning. As Will mentioned earlier, in the next decade, we're going to see some three billion people on our planet switch on the lights, meaning they're going to come online. Three billion people on our planet will suddenly be connected to the global economy, suddenly be con connected and able to contribute to innovation around the world. This is transfer a radical transformation happening before our very eyes. This is largely driven by a number of different efforts. One of these is the Facebook drone. Another one is Google's loon, which are balloons that will float around the planet and provide internet connectivity. But this means a radical opportunity for everyone on our planet to contribute to innovation, to contribute to solving our global grand challenges. And in the educational world, there are many different efforts that have been out there. Can you raise your hand if you've ever taken a MOOC, a massive online open course, basically an online course? Raise your hand if you've taken one. Okay, R keep, raise your hand if you completed one. <laughs> okay, you're studious. <laughs> the problem with MOOCs, and even Sebastian Thrun himself, one of the godfathers of MOOCs, says MOOCs 1.0 were largely a failure because people take them, but they don't finish them. So online learning passively enough wasn't enough. So there are whole new innovations happening to try to make education more accessible. One of them is this group here called Bridge International Academy that I had the privilege to go and visit in Kenya last year. And what they do is rather than taking trained teachers and spending the investment in training a teacher for many, many, many years, they take anybody who is literate, and give them a pad, a cheap pad, like an iPad, and they read the curriculum from that pad. So the quality of the content remains the same and is accessible around the world. So this is a teacher, and you can see he's holding a pad. He's basically reading the lesson to the class. Malaria. <laughs> the symptoms of malaria include Feeling cold, this is a malaria shivering, class. fever, joint pain, headache, loss of appetite, anemia, or a wrap of red blood cells in the body, nausea and vomiting. So you can see that, that classroom setting. The kids are sitting on wooden, wooden chairs. There's barely a chalkboard there. They don't even have school books. And yet he has this very powerful piece of technology in his hand that's reading the curriculum. And he's able to read the curriculum. And if that curriculum needs to be updated, Bridge International can update the entire curriculum for its thousands of schools with the press of a button. All schools, all teachers retrained simultaneously. Currently, right now, XPRIZE, which is a sister organization also founded by Peter Diamandis with Singularity University, is running a learning prize where anyone who can take a child from zero literacy, basically illiterate, to being literate in one year without the assistance of a human will win the prize. And sure enough, they're making tremendous progress. They're actually prototyping these right now in Tanzania. And I think it's a $15 million or $10 million X prize for anyone who's able to achieve that. Learning is also taking huge leaps forward in terms of the quality for places like Japan and in the United States where basic learning is already achieved. We're trying to take it to another level. This is the f an example of the future of learning. Imagine a giant lava ball that's been flying for billions of years through space. 
where it is so cold that its outer layers froze to stone. But That's Peter, he's an avatar. The core remained as hot as the surface of the sun. He's that home ill. Is our planet. But he can still uh, be a class. Can anybody tell me how old our planet is? Peter can sit that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, so... That's right. Hello, Malachi. Hi, Hi professor. professor. Let me take a look. I see, for a four-cylinder engine, the typical firing order. One, three, four, two. Try connecting the spark plugs in that order. Thanks, Thanks professor. professor. So that's the future of learning. And in fact, already, there's uh, the many, many examples of using virtual reality and augmented reality in the classrooms now. So it's not even the future, it's happening right now. Governance is also one of our systems which is ripe for disruption. It's a number of different efforts right now, Lumio, Liquid Democracy, Swarm Fund, which are examples of using emerging technology that you're going to be hearing more about tomorrow, the blockchain, for revolutionizing governance itself. Liquid Democracy, for example, changes our representative democracy to direct democracy, meaning every single one of us can have a direct vote on every single policy initiative, or if I don't feel very knowledgeable about a certain issue, I can allocate my vote to somebody who I feel I trust and is knowledgeable, and she can then allocate her vote to somebody and eventually make the final vote. That's a very different system because right now we elect our leaders, a single leader, to represent us on all issues. That's just not possible. Liquid democracy allows that to be much more dynamic and, and relate it directly to us. Prosperity. The end of poverty is almost here. It's not quite here. The World Bank uh, made a big announcement a few years ago that we are, are rapidly closing in on ending poverty. And they made this announcement. And then about six months after they made, made the announcement, they said, actually, we were wrong. Our predictions were based on the tremendous progress that China had made lifting people out of, policy, all, out of poverty with uh, policy changes. And yet, that, those policy changes uh, weren't enough to satisfy the needs of people around, in the, around the world who have structural and endemic poverty in, in pockets. So in fact, yes, ending poverty is within our sights, but it's not as easy as the World Bank uh, had predicted. Corruption is something we need to be looking head on. We need to address it head on. Roughly around $3 trillion per year, 5% of our G global GDP is lost and wasted due to corruption. Fortunately, thing, technology like blockchain is going to help us address this by making financial transactions not transparent and also to reduce middlemen who tend to take off their, little, their slice of the pie every time money is moved through them. And at the same time that we're trying to end poverty, a whole new challenge is emerging, actually largely driven by ver the exponential technologies that we're talking about. Artificial intelligence and robotics are leading us into what some call technological unemployment. This is an issue which is a, a pressing issue of our, of our time right now, and estimates of anywhere close to 50% of all job titles that exist today will not exist 20 years from now, including blue-collar jobs and white-collar jobs across the board. Now the question is, will new jobs emerge that we can't even imagine right now? Or, as some argue, this represents a qualitative shift, and it could lead to whole new changes the way that we relate to work, and it could, relate, could lead to social disruption. And some of the solutions that are being proposed to address that, well, one of them in particular is of interest because both ends of the political economic spectrum come to the same agreement, and that is universal basic income is a notion that could help us resolve and address technological unemployment. And in fact, we see 
pilots of universal basic income happening in Finland, in Canada, in Kenya, and even the state of Hawaii in the United States is talking about universal basic income. So there could be a time in our future where by birthright, as a human, you're given a universal basic income. And then there's this issue of fairness. Exponential technology is wondrous, and yet it has the tendency of amplifying the differences that we have. And already, income inequality is a severe problem that we have in the world. Fairness is something that is built into us, and this video demonstrates that very well. These are two monkeys. Both of the monkeys have been trained. If they give the researcher a rock, they, uh, I'm sorry, if they give the researcher a rock, the researcher gives them back a piece of cucumber. Except for this time, the researcher does something different. And she gives one of the monkeys a grape. And if you're a monkey, do you want cucumbers or grapes? Grapes, they're sweet. So let's see what happens. I'm getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> yeah. Are we really that different from monkeys? Genetically, we're not. I think we all know in our heart, fairness is built into us. So when we see something that is entirely unfair, we react. And I don't think a shield is going to be good enough. A face shield is going to be good enough. So we actually have to design for inclusivity. We have to design for abundance for all if we're able to actually live in an abundant world. These global grand challenges represent exponential opportunities. If you are a corporation that's looking for new markets, if you're an entrepreneur who's looking for the next new big thing to invest in, I'm sorry, if you're, looking for, if you're an entrepreneur who's looking for the new innovation, and if you're an investor who's looking for an investment that's going to pay off big returns, all of these global grand challenges represent opportunities for you. But this requires, especially if you are a corporation, a different way of thinking. We've gotten used to thinking that solving the world's biggest problems is something that governments do. Solving the world's biggest problems is something that corporations throw a little bit of money at for corporate social responsibility, or what was called triple bottom line thinking. That is the old way of thinking. These, opportunity, these global grand challenges represent core opportunities for new business. In fact, the godfather of triple bottom line thinking, a man named John Elkington, was at Singularity University last year, and he himself, this is the person who developed triple bottom line thinking, said that is the old school. What we really need to be looking at is the opportunity for business and wealth creation by solving the world's biggest challenges. And in fact, if you look at the SDG framework, there's an estimate that roughly somewhere between 90 and 120 trillion dollars of investment is going to happen between now and 2030 to solve the SDGs. That's 13 years, roughly $100 trillion is at play of investment from governments and from corporations and from banks to solve the world's biggest challenges. There's tremendous money involved here. And the reason why is because every single one of our social systems, our food system, our water system, our governance system, our security system, our environmental system, our energy system, every single one of those systems is now being radically transformed before our very eyes. They're being restructured, recreated,
powered by exponential technology. And in the midst of all that structure and all that change is the opportunity for investors, for corporations, and for entrepreneurs to take advantage. And this is really the call and, 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 the, and, and I'm, I would, the offer to you to put on that, that mindset. There's a website here that if you'd like to, to find out uh, more details about how they calculated that $100 trillion amount and also more specifics by every single one of the SDG areas, what the opportunities are, I suggest you check this out. Let's look at just a couple of them. Upgrading informal housing alone is a market of $300 billion. $300 billion. If that's not interesting, I don't know what is. This is a market that, will, that is being disrupted and the opportunities in 3D printing houses, for example, being powered by exponential technology are huge. Another one is smart water tech. All of our water systems are going to go through a revolution. One trillion dollars by the year 2025 is in motion to redesign our water. One trillion dollars. So there's massive change happening. This is a, a, comes from the world population prospects, and you see uh, demographics, which I, I find this graph really profound. And this is basically the population demographics. The gray is from now onwards. And you see two big trends here. First of all, North America, Latin America, all those lines in the bottom are staying pretty much stagnant. In Asia, you've already seen tremendous population growth but your curve is starting to taper off. Where is the growth coming from in the future? Africa. Africa is where, the, where it's at. Africa is interesting because it's also a place that has the biggest challenges in the world. This is where the most people are going to live, and this is where the, some of the world's big, most uh, vast resources are. So if you think about Africa as a problem now, don't. It's actually a huge opportunity area. So we do have these global grand challenges. Our mindset is each one of these are solvable. And to summarize, I want to present to you abundance drivers. What is driving us towards abundance? Exponential technology, in particular the price, performance, and form factor. The fact that we are able to design increasingly with the fundamental building blocks of matter. I already gave you a few examples of designing at the atomic and molecular level. We're able to manipulate matter at that level to design and create the things that we need and that we want. And then on the far other extreme, we're increasingly treating our planet Earth as it should be treated, as one single global unit of analysis, whether it be for climate change or interconnectivity of all of us people with global empathy and care and compassion for people around the world. What is abundance deniers? What's holding us back? Number one is our mindset. Our mindset is huge. What you think is what becomes reality. And hopefully in this summit, you'll take on this mindset of exponential technology or exponential trends and also an abundance mindset. Another one is policy, reactive policy. Technology grows at exponential rates. Policy tends to grow linearly. And that disconnect poses huge challenges. Our legislatures, our governance systems need to develop policies which are not reactive, but proactive. As I mentioned earlier, inequality and lack of inclusion will hold us back from abundance, and it will create an unstable system if we do not uh, include all people on our path towards abundance. As well, our business models, which are based on scarcity, and IP, which is based on scarcity, is going to hold us back. These will, be, these will also change. When you think about the abundance uh, drivers and abundance deniers, those will always be in balance. And when you go to bed at night and you think, gosh, oh, can we really solve the world's biggest challenges? I'd like you to reflect on this, this tweet that came from Barack Obama, which was the most liked tweet ever. And he just tweeted this about two weeks ago because in the United States, you might have seen, we've been having some issues. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love.
For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. That comes from Nelson Mandela. This well describes the mechanism by which the moral arc of the universe moves us towards a positive, abundant future. It's because the simple act of love by each one of us, the simple act of each one of us doing what we can to solve the world's biggest challenges will lead to an abundant future. And I'd like to leave you with one last image. Elephants, when they're young and they need to be trained, have chains tied to their legs, such that when the elephant, little elephant tries to move away, it gets pulled on its, on its leg and it hurts. And when it pulls harder, it hurts more. When it's bi a big elephant, a massive, massive elephant, you can tie a loose rope around its leg, tied to a little peg in the ground, and that elephant won't even move away. It just stays. It stays because it has a mindset of holding me back. What I'd like you to reflect on is to break that chain because we've all been trained ever since we were young to think linearly and to think in a scarcity mindset when in fact our world is exponential and abundant. I'd like you to reflect on that as you go through this summit and to think about how each and every single one of us can activate ourselves to create an abundant future. Thank you.